talking to Alan Small. He is um, the head of the Ontario Libra I want to call it. <laughs> I can hear a lot of libertarians ch chuckling and laughing over that one, the Ontario Liberation Party. Uh, the Ontario Libertarian Party. Now, they are a group that um, really believes in small government, even more so than conservatives. So we're going to get a chance to talk to him. And uh, I've got a list of questions here, and I certainly invite yours as well during the, con during the conversation. But we'll keep the phone lines open. So if you've got anything you want to ask Mr. Small, please feel free. Um, I'm sure it'll be an entertaining conversation, to put it mildly. All right, with that, we'll um, go to the news and information at the top of the hour. And when we come back in the next segment, it'll be Alan Small. Can I take your order? Uh, I'll have coffee, eggs, and hash browns. You want a side order a Nick with that? Yeah, I think I will. Good Sunday morning, Ottawa. It's time to top up your Java and join the discussion on Sunny Side Nick. The number's to call 613-521-TALK. That's 521-8255. Toll free 1-800-580-CFRA. Email Nick at night at CFRA.com. Well, it looks like your order's ready. Here's 580 CFRA's Nick. Welcome back, everybody. My guest on the phone from, I believe he's in Toronto, is Alan Small, who is the president of the Ontario Libertarian Party. Did I get that right, Alan? Uh, not exactly. I'm in Markham, <laughs> Nick. Uh, uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, and, uh, and I'm the leader of the party, not the president. Oh, okay. Well, all right. I use the president. Detail. Yes, I know. We won't split hairs over that. You're the no. guy in charge. <laughs> well, I, I'm part of an executive committee, let's put it that way. All right, fair enough. We'll settle on that. Um, Alan, uh, first of all, I guess one of the things, uh, let me begin uh, by getting you to lay out a little bit of your personal history, whatever you want to share. Uh, let us know who you are and how you get into politics in the first place. Uh, I've never been political. I was, uh, you know, when I was, a, when I was a youngster, actually, a teenager, I, I read, uh, uh, in high school, I read Atlas Shrugged <laughs> by Ayn Rand. And I mm -hmm. think that pretty much started me on the road to the, the way I was thinking. So I was just a teenager then. And I actually joined, uh, what was then in Toronto, an objectivist movement, uh, I just, you know, I, I, things started happening. I started uh, getting, I got a job, I got married, and so that just sort of fell by the wayside. And actually, I became a teacher and uh, w w worked uh, as a public school teacher, a, a high school teacher, till in, in the city of Toronto, till uh, 19, until 2002. So that was 30 years. I retired from that, and then I went on to teach in a private school for five years. And when I retired from teaching after 35 years, uh, teaching high school, I, I figured, oh, I better do something. So I figured here, here was my chance to, to start a new career, save the world, revisit some of my uh, ideas, uh, the, the idea that, uh, that it's important, you know, that, that small government is important. And having been a teacher, I, I, I saw all the bad things that, could, that happened to you as a teacher, and I realized that... Maybe I could do something. So I looked around and I found the Ontario Libertarian Party. I, I didn't join the party until 2008. And actually, I joined both the federal party, the, the uh, Libertarian Party of Canada, and the Ontario Libertarian Party at the same time. And I quickly uh, was sort of immersed into the fire because in 2008, there was a federal election. And I ran <clears throat> as a candidate here in here in Markham Unionville, as mm -hmm. uh, against John McCallum, who was the incumbent, and uh, you know, I, I sort of started becoming very political then, and and and, and of course, I hadn't been. I, I, my primary interest is science. So, as a as a now now in my new political uh, career, I figured, okay, well, let's join the Ontario Party and. And uh, see what I can do, and uh, I, I became part of the executive, and, uh, and and I became the leader in in November this past November. So you chose. Is it because of your educational background that your your time in the Ontario educational system that led you into the Ontario version rather than the federal version of the party? Uh, the federal. I, I found that the fed the Ontario version is is uh, a little better organized uh, and and obviously closer 
closer to my roots, closer to home. Mm. It's easier to to communicate with people. The Fed, you know, it's a huge country. Yes, it and, is. And uh, the federal leader at the time was out in Alberta, and, and we obviously don't have a lot in common with Alberta, except that we we inhabit the same country. So I figured, no, let's let's go go local, and uh, local is Ontario, and and it really had nothing to do with my being a teacher, um, although I I understood that that education has some serious issues, and a lot of them have to do with the fact that that uh, it's run by the government. All right. Well, let's get into the party itself then. Now that we know a little bit about you, um, what makes the Libertarians different than any other political party on the map in Ontario? Well, the people in my party believe that people should have uh, choices in their lives. Now, you, your previous in the previous hour, you were talking about smoking. Mm-hmm. Well, we we think that smoking, because it's legal, it should. And, and by the way, we think it should be legal. It's something that people should be able to choose or not to choose, but they should also live and or die with the consequences of their choice. Uh, in fact, our, our, the, the motto of our party is the party of choice. So that's, that's primarily our fundamental belief. We believe people should have choices to be able to control their own lives as much as possible. And we also think the government has a role, but that role should be very limited, strictly limited to protecting certain things, namely our right to life, liberty, and property. Uh, that's it. That's, that's pretty much what we believe. But that's, that's huge when you start to apply it to, to uh, what's happening in the world. Easy to say, not so easy to do. Not exactly. Okay, well, because here's the thing, because I'm thinking I, I'm a conservative myself, and many of the things that you believe in uh, we have a common interest in, smaller yeah. government, lower taxes, things like that. Right. But from what I understand, you folks tend to go a little further than perhaps the average conservative voter would go. Well, you know, the word conservative, uh, I think the addiction comes from the word to conserve, right. to, to keep things the same. Well, we, we don't want to keep things the same. That's not what we're about. What we want is that people should have control over their lives. And yes, we're very fiscally responsible, and we share that in common with conservatives, but we're extremely socially liberal in, the, in that we would uh, tolerate all sorts of things that many people would not tolerate, including, uh, well, cigarette smoking, of course, which, and by the, by the way, I find that, uh, I, I find it myself abhorrent. I've never done it, but I don't think that I'm uh, king of the world and, and, and have any right to tell, you know, I have no moral authority to tell someone they can't do that. So they can choose to smoke cigarettes, smoke marijuana, whatever they choose, as long as they're not affecting uh, other people's rights in, in, in any way. And All so right. in that regard, we, we, we go a little bit further than the conservative. Uh, and I think typically conservatives would be against some that, of those things. But, at least, but yeah. maybe not. You know, well, it's a freedom issue. All right, Alan, hang on for a second. We have to take a pause. Okay. And uh, when we're finished with that pause, I will get into some of the actual uh, policies specifically. Okay. Um, all right. So you just stay right there. And we'll be right back with Alan Small. Uh, it's 521-8255 is the number. Sunnyside Nick is the show. And this is CFRA. You're enjoying Sunnyside Nick on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. All right. Welcome back. Alan Small is my guest. He is the leader of the Ontario Libertarian Party. And we, uh, in the first segment, we were talking a little bit about him and started to get into the policies of the party. So let's do that. Um, I thought we'd start with, um, well, let's take the role of the police, the, 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 the um, authority of the, of the estate of the state, in this case, the province of Ontario. What is the proper role? Because we hear a lot more now, instead of law enforcement, we now have officers who keep the peace, and there's a difference there. Um, well, in fact, uh, in, our, in our political philosophy, we think that the police play, the, the, the role of the government is to be the, the justice of the, of, the, uh, of the province. In fact, so the police are vitally important. The justice system is vitally important. Uh, we believe in rule of law. And it's that, and it's that one thing that separates, for example, a place like Canada from 
some of the uh, Wild West places in the world where things just don't seem to work ever, no matter how much money you throw at it. And as long as you have the rule of law, you're going to have uh, people uh, functioning properly and uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, the motto of Canada, peace, order, and good government. Well, that's, that's exactly what we think good government represents, keeping the peace, making certain that people follow the rules, and making sure that there are just enough rules to keep everyone, everyone's rights protected, but not too many rules to get into the, in the way of people. And so, yes, police have a, a, a vital role and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we have this, the system that we have. All right, well, let's talk about the justice system because you, you mentioned it, and I was going to go there next anyway because the police and the justice system kind of work hand in hand. Um, with the justice system that we have today, in theory, um, it is, I think, the best uh, system that the world has yet conceived for uh, dealing with uh, issues that involve uh, legalities or criminal activity or things like that. I don't think there's a better system out there Yet the reality is that justice usually translates into tax revenue collection in a lot of cases, fines and so on for speeding and things like that. When it comes down to the criminal side of things, we see sentences. I, I can't remember the last time somebody got more than, say, four or five years for sometimes some very serious crimes. What would you do differently? Like, is, you, is that acceptable to you, that the justice system work in that fashion? Would you want more... Uh, to go a little heavier on the punishment and a little less on the, um, uh, what's the word, um, where you take somebody and you change them. I can't think of the, um, there's a phrase for it, and I can't think of what it is. Uh, <laughs> well, no, I, we, actually, we, we think, we like, we focus more on the victim. Uh, the victim has had a, you know, if, if we're talking about a real crime, and by the way, let's, let's talk, stick to real crime. Okay, well, let's, let's say bank robbery. We'll, we'll pick okay. a particular crime. All right, a particular crime. Uh, yes, that that's actually fairly straightforward. Uh, the purpose of the purpose of the police is to find the robber to uh, to uh, somehow repay the bank the money, find the money, and if the bank is not repaid by finding the money, then part of the uh, the, the the act of a retribution to the criminal would be to to get that person to pay the pay back the bank the money that was stolen. Mm. So uh, there's not a whole lot of point. I you know I don't believe in warehousing uh, prisoners in jails for huge lengths of time because I in, in many ways I think you put a person in jail or into prison and they actually um, feed on one another and they come out much worse than they were when they went in. Uh, so I, I'm not. Uh, I don't believe in punishment as much as I do in um, restoring justice to the victim. So you're more into restorative justice than you are in yes. punitive. Exactly. Okay. Well, let me ask you this then, because that was a very clear-cut case. Let's do, let's deal with an area of the justice system that is a little murkier: family justice, uh, the family mm-hmm. court system, as an example. Yes. And let's face it, that for many people, is a nightmare. How do you decide? How would how would the libertarian set up a, set up justice, overhaul it, change it, or maybe even just leave it as it is, um, so that it is it performs better than it does now? That it serves this idea of smaller government, people living with the responsibility of their actions, and so on. Well, I you know one of the things that uh, if I knew all the answers to everything, I would not be here talking to you, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I believe in the I believe in the market, and I believe that there is a way that uh, free markets can um, create uh, uh, justice for people. And so, you know, if, if we 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 have a let's just think for a second back to the Wild West, what people mm. used to call the Wild West. It really wasn't all that wild. People used to get. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, their rights were protected. They could hire people to uh, get them um, uh, uh, justice by doing things like, uh, you know, find the person that is, is is a very good mediator and is able to settle things. So I I I, I can't say that I would give I would have the answer to restoring family justice, but I think that if you leave it to a, a market, you'll get 
some people that will be better at this than others, and the, those are the people that you really want to, uh, to control the, uh, the family justice system. I don't think it's going to be something that's, um, that's going to come from top down. I think it comes from, from the bottom. You know, the, the, our, our whole justice system is based on common law, and I think that's, that's the way it should be. Uh, laws should be made by the people for the people and not by someone from the top who thinks they know the best way to do it. Would you restructure then, based on that, the way that um, uh, we represent ourselves in the political system and maybe even the voting system itself? Uh, or would you like to? Maybe not would you, but would you? Is that something the Ontario, the Ontario Libertarian Party would be interested in, in studying and looking at? Oh, you know, the voting system, I think, is fine. Uh, that's not the problem. Um, the problem, I think, is that uh, people are uh, not left with any options when they go to vote. Uh, I wouldn't restrain. I, I think the I think the Elections Ontario does a does a very good job at mm. uh, at what it does. It's an important function. It's it's part of democracy. That's what democracy is about. It's picking the people. It's not necessarily picking the way things should be done. It's picking the people who arbitrate the, the way. Yes. So okay. I, I, you know, I, I'm I'm all in favor of democracy to a point, and 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 the most important part of democracy is the is the uh, ability to choose the person you want to do the thing you want to do, not put a top down law on someone and say, well, this is the way. This is the way this mob of people, you know, the perfect example of uh, the liberals have uh, certain ideas on the way this should be done and that should be done, and it's top down. It doesn't come from the people, really. They, Mr. McGinty is, is, is great at saying, well, we think this is the way it should be done, and that's not the way we would we would go with it. All right, well, since we're, we're, one of the things I wanted to get into was the um, health uh, issue is the idea of having socialized medicine. If I can extrapolate from what you're telling me, you would not be so interested in maintaining a social sa- well, I don't want to even use the word social safety net, but a socialized medical system. Uh, obviously, I'm thinking you probably have something else in mind. Yeah, we, we you know, I, I think the OHIP system is, is horrible. Uh, just, you know, I'm not going to mint words. Uh, there's no choice. People who really uh, people people have to if OHIP is 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 a rationed system. If you want to get X done, uh, it'll get done. Yes, but not necessarily when you're ready to have it done or even alive to have it done. You may have to wait on a very long line, or you may choose to go to another jurisdiction and have it done in another part, another country. So, so there's a there's there's a better way to do this, and 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 I know healthcare is a huge issue for Canadians. If you ask any Canadian, they'll tell you that somehow the government should be involved in healthcare. Well, of course we don't believe that, but since since the government is involved in healthcare, at least find a system that works well. And and one of the systems that works very well, I believe, is the Swiss system. They don't even have socialized medicine. Uh, but the government regulates the insurance industry to a degree, uh, not not totally, but regulates it to a degree. And of course, we don't we don't like regulation, but we'll we'll go along with it as lo- because I think it, it allows better choices. And so this is a this is an option that we would choose if we were elected, for example, tomorrow. We'd say, okay, the Swiss system is a is a very good system. So what they do is the government regulates the insurance industry. They define what health services must be offered. They provide uh, very generous packages uh, as, for, as far as doctor's visits, hospital stays, medications even, which we don't do that much here except for seniors, physical therapy, physician-ordered rehab, in-home nursing, and it's equal access health care. Everybody gets it. It's universal. And you, and you actually have to purchase the plan. But you don't purchase it from the government. It's not, all, it's not like OHIP where you don't even know how much you're paying. You actually purchase it. You get a bill, and you purchase it from one of 92 different private insurers in Switzerland. So you have a lot of choice. And, and that's what we need here. It's, it's also not, any, it's not connected to employers at all. The employers don't provide the insurance, so 
you don't ha you don't have to feel obligated to stick to a particular job to get this insurance. Like for example, Americans in the American system, a lot of people are very reluctant to quit their job because they know their employer is going to provide them insurance. So, so this is not not related to employment employment at all. People are free to shop around for coverage. They get benefits for their needs. They don't feel obligated to stay on the job just to get the health benefits. All right, and that's very important. Mr. Small, I gotta ha I gotta ask you to pause there. Okay. Uh, I've got more for you when we get back from the news and information update. So please I can stay there. Explain more about the Swiss system. <laughs> yeah, well, I have got a question for you about that, and we'll get to that right after this. Five two one eight two five five. This is Sunny Side Mix Show on CFRA. Over easy, but not too soft. Sunny Side Nick on News Talk Radio five eighty CFRA. Okay, welcome back, everybody. My guest in the studio, or not in the studio, he's on the phone from Markham, is uh, the president, or no, sorry, the leader of the Ontario Libertarian Party, Alan Small. Uh, thanks for holding, Alan. Yes. I want, we want to, I want to get back into this idea of the Swiss model, because while you were explaining it, and I, I don't think you're finished yet quite explaining right. it, but uh, based on what I'd heard so far, I can see a little fly in the ointment. Okay. And that would be... Okay, I make fifteen thousand dollars a year, and I can't afford to buy the pro the pot the healthcare package. Well, you already buy the healthcare package. the The fact is that uh, it's hard to tell, but a, a good fraction of your income tax goes into buy the healthcare package, and I must I estimate that it's probably about four thousand dollars a year that you're paying. Uh, even so, if you're making fifteen thousand dollars a year, that's 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 probably uh, poverty level, right? Well, I'm only using that as a figure. I'm not suggesting that's what I make myself. I'm just saying a person who makes that kind of money doesn't pay any taxes, by the way, because whatever they do pay, they get back. Exactly. So, so, the, so in the, in that instance, and in the, and there there are probably I don't know how many people are in that situation, but in that instance, the government does come in and and uh, in fact, in Switzerland, if you're if you're uh, co they they also have co-pays, and so if your monthly premium and your co-pays exceed eight percent of your first personal income, the government subsidizes the cost. Okay, so there is at least a, some small subsidy yes. for certain people within the society. Yes, those so, people that really can't afford it. Okay, because that's you know that's one of the great cries about the American system. Too many people don't have health care. Well, they forget to tell you eighty-five percent do, uh, but that's. The point is that when you hear people who object to anything but the Canadian model, the one thing they always bring up is, well, what do you do about what, what do you do for the poor? And, and yeah, of exactly. course, that's the answer to everything. You know, that's the question that they always have about everything. And I'm not averse to having the government step in as a last resort. Uh, way back in the old days, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I do, uh, uh, Vaguely, <laughs> not that old, but I do recall that uh, there were charities that did that in in the Toronto area. The, um, the Salvation Army, if you needed surgery uh, in Toronto, there there was a Salvation Army hospital called the Grace Hospital, it still exists, mm -hmm. that uh, performed surgeries for people who were indigent. And by that, I mean people who could not afford. Uh, well, that was the reason for coming into existence in the first place. First place for a lot of our um, our um, yeah to make everybody so, equal. No, I, I was going to say the uh, service clubs like the Rotary and the Knights of Columbus, exactly, and exactly. And all those yeah. groups, right? They came Absolutely. in to fill a need. Shriners, excellent example mm. of, hosp of, of of taking care of children's hospitals all around uh, the world. In fact, all right, um, I want to talk about energy because that's a hot topic lately. We've got the Green Energy Act and the disaster that is. I don't think there's. Yeah. There, there are some people who will never change their mind on it, but from my perspective, this thing is nothing but a massive sinkhole, and I don't see it getting any time, getting better anytime soon. So you wake up tomorrow, you're the premier. What do you do about energy? Uh, we would, we would first probably look at the Green Energy Act, which is the act that um, uh, Mr. McGinty has used to close down uh, coal plants all around Ontario. A lot of the, most, most of the coal plants have been closed already and uh, has, have created this ridiculous system 
called FIT, feed-in tariff, and mm -hmm. micro-FIT, which is just a smaller version of the feed-in tariff system where they they pay people. They they actually say, okay, look, you want to you you have a piece of land. We're going to stick a windmill on this property, and uh, you're going to get 82 cents a kilowatt hour for every kilowatt hour of energy that you produce from that windmill. And of course, what do you and I pay for for electricity? Well, we pay something in the, in the neighborhood, something less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So the government subsidizes these green energy boondoggles uh, hugely. We're talking solar and wind. And those, of course, can't be solutions to problems in Ontario because the sun don't shine much in November, December, January, and February here in Ontario. Not only that, the wind doesn't blow uh, for a large part of the, the, the hottest days in the summer. We've had a very hot summer, and uh, if you've been nearby one of these huge uh, wind turbine machines, you'll notice they stand still a lot mm -hmm. in, the, in the hot, humid weather. So I don't think that's the way to go. I think uh, the way to go is to continue to use fossil fuels. And if you don't like coal, we have lots and lots and lots of natural gas. Uh, we have natural gas, probably uh, reserves that go on for hundreds of years. They keep finding more by using this technique called fracking. And uh, so, so build natural gas um, uh, power plants. Uh, they've actually uh, they they pollute so much less. They, uh, they they you can turn them on and turn them off very quickly. Uh, they. They work at night. <laughs> they work when the wind doesn't blow. Yeah, they're not weather dependent. And and, and furthermore, we 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 would also uh, break apart the huge monopoly that uh, Ontario Power Generation is. Okay, and now we, you got my interest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we we'd uh, we'd localize it. You know, they're, they're, what if you're a business and you need power? Well. You could build your own power um, station right beside your business to guarantee yourself power and any extra power you could produce, you could sell off to neighboring um, communities. I, I think that the only way you're going to get uh, energy costs down, and by the way, they're, the, they're always going up. You, you, you know, your, hyd your hydro bills are increasing year after year after year, and yet just about every other utility bill you have is going down. Your cable bill is going down. Take a look at your telephone bill. Uh, back in the old days, a long-distance call used to cost a fortune, and then they opened it up to uh, co com competition, and the price has done nothing but go down, 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 down. It's almost now free to, to speak long-distance anywhere in North America on many systems. Yet energy costs keep going up, 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 and then why is that? Well, it's because there's no competition, and and again, this is a this is a situation that can be handled better by the market. All right. Well, let me ask you this then, because uh, if you're going to be reducing the size of size of government, and I, I'm guessing that you probably would be looking at ministries that uh, are redundant or programs that are redundant and eliminating them. Um, you know, Absolutely. Just rolling back the the model that the government is. And yes. by the way, anybody out there who has, I'm, getting, I'm involved in the conversation, I forgot to, refer, to invite others to join us at 5218255. But the, the thing I'm curious about is, to me at least, the best incentive uh, for, the best way to make things more efficient is let the free market come up with its own ideas, like you lay out some parameters. Yeah. In what areas would you do that? Well, like if you, let's say that um, uh, you want a technological advancement in, in a given area. Where do you think it's best suited? Like, are we talking energy? Are we talking uh, science and technology? Or maybe all of them? Well, uh, again, you know, that's, that's why, should, why should the government be allowed to pick who should be the winner and who should be the loser? Let the market do, do its thing. The market does a wonderful job at providing us food. You know, the, the, the government is very has a very small uh, uh, involvement in the production and distribution of food throughout this province and throughout, throughout much of North America. You walk into a supermarket, I'm always amazed at how much food there was. There are, there are foods from all over the world that have got there and they're, and they're fresh, and the government wasn't even involved in any of it except maybe to collect a tariff uh, once it entered the country. 
how is that possible? How could you know? Imagine if the government was was uh, involved in the in the distribution of food that we we'd have shortages and lineups like they did back in the old Soviet Union. Um, so I I don't know what exactly. I mean, I mean you're right. We would get rid of ministry, the entire ministries, and I know that's. Uh, that doesn't sound right to a lot of people because that means they're going to lose jobs. But the fact is, uh, there's too many jobs in the public sector, and that's probably part of the, the reason that we have such high taxes. And all of those people that are going to be, uh, well, I hate to say let go, but that's what's going to happen when a ministry closes, they will find jobs. I guarantee it. There'll be other, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, uh, in my own uh, writing here, the um, the uh, MPP that represents my writing is Michael Chan. He's the Minister of Tourism and Culture, or something like that. I forget the exact name of the ministry. That would be a ministry we'd get rid of in a minute. Um, and I, and and there's a very good uh, precedent for that. The uh, the American system, as many of you know, are uh, is undergoing some uh, difficulties. <laughs> which I think we will be uh, getting into eventually here in Canada. But in the state of Washington, they had to close down their tourism department because uh, uh, they thought, well, we're going to have to make some hard choices, so let's close down the tourism department. Now, the state of Washington out west is a wonderful ski. You know, they have ski facilities and wonderful resorts there. But guess what happened when they closed down the Department of Tourism that was run entirely by the government? What happened was that it was immediately taken over by private sector hoteliers and resorts. They came in and they formed a uh, non-governmental, non-tax sucking uh, organization that promotes tourism to Washington. There's no tax involvement. Probably many of the people that worked for the Department of Tourism in Washington got jobs with the uh, in the private sector. The private sector. And there you go. There's there's the elimination of a responsibility that the government just doesn't belong in. All right. You know why would why why does the why I can't imagine why the government has any involvement in, in, in tourism. Why you know if they're involved in tourism, why aren't they involved in everything? Yeah. Well, they they want to be. Alan, I'm going to ask you to pause there, and we'll come back with the final segment right after this. 521-8255. My guest is Alan Small. He's the head of the Ontario Liber- Libertarian Party. You're enjoying Sunny Side Nick on News Talk Radio 580 CFRA. All right. You've got one more segment if you want to ask Alan a question. Alan Small is my guest. He is the president, the leader. I leader, mean, yeah. almost a prime minister. <laughs> I heard <laughs> Leader one step at a time, huh? <laughs> yeah, leader one step at a time, exactly. That's right. All right, uh, Alan, I wanted to uh, talk to you about, um, everybody knows that Quebec has its own uh, immigration policy and is yeah. very um, aggressive in enforcing it. Would you, th- would you promote the same idea for Ontario, like the idea of controlling who comes in our front door? With, while immigration is generally considered a federal power, if Quebec can do it, then the logic extends that we should be able to do it too. Um, would you would you support that idea? How would it work if you do? Uh, if you don't support it, why not? Well, uh, I'm an immigrant. <laughs> My parents came here after the war. I was born over in Europe. Um, I, you know, I I really think that immigration is the lifeblood of this country, uh, but. I think the big problem that, that uh, maybe that you're not uh, voicing is that uh, you think that some or that a lot of people think this, and I know it's true that when immigrants come here, they uh, people view them as being somehow a um, a burden. They get health care, they get all of the uh, things that we offer. Well, of course, if we were the government, when there would be fewer things that we offer, and we would not offer them in that way. Uh, when my parents came here, uh, on, oh, 1948, I believe, uh, they were the government was not involved. Uh, they they were handled by an agency that was a, a group of people that voluntarily took care of them. Uh, my parents quickly 
uh, joined various groups that uh, were like them. They they were uh, given, you know, sort of bootstrap help to get themselves started. And that's the way I think it should be. If you're going to have immigrants come in, I think those people that are already here or voluntary groups should should come forth and say, yes, we're, we're going to help the immigrants because immigrants are important here. They, they, they come in, most many of them come in and they, uh, they take jobs that Canadians won't take. Uh, for example, um, so I, I, I would leave immigration alone. Okay, I, well, I, let me clarify maybe a little bit what I meant. I'm not okay. suggesting for a second that we don't need him, or we don't, I, I don't even say need, that we shouldn't have immigration or that we should be, uh, you know, selfish in the way that we uh, deal with immigrants. That's not true because all of us are immigrants sooner or later. Yes. Uh, what I'm trying to get at, though, is because Ontario receives so many of Canada's immigrants, yeah. in Toronto, especially in your neck of the woods, uh, in, here in Ottawa, we receive a pretty, a pretty large share. And in all the major centers in the, in the, in the province, there are large um, communities of, of immigrants. And uh, let me include refugees in that as well, because they, they, have, um, they bring a, a, a set of circumstances with them as well. Mm-hmm. So I guess what I'm suggesting is, do you, would you support the idea of allowing Ontario to be more selective in not only, well, maybe not where because of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but who they let in uh, from Canada's overall uh, intake and say, okay, look, we can only handle so many, so we're going to set up these criteria to to figure out who we're going to take in. Uh, The only thing I would really want our people, the government, to check is is the criminal records, that things of that sort, we don't want to have people that come in that have uh, ill intent in the country, but otherwise, no. I, I would uh, I would al- allow people to come here to settle, to uh, find their own way, to uh, set up their own systems, to to join the market. All right. They, you know, those are the people that come here and they they need. You know, they they start to buy homes, they start to buy furniture, they 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 get the economy running. We need immigration. All right. Well, let me let me hit two more topics here because we're getting close to the top of the hour, and that'll wrap the show. Uh, first of all, you mentioned limit, limiting government. Now, I know you've talked about eliminating ministries and so on, yeah. uh, but exactly what do you mean by that? Like, what do you see as the limits to the government's reach? I mean, I know you're a big free market guy, as I am, yeah. uh, but somehow you have to draw a line between what's, a, what, what's an acceptable uh, job for the state to do and where the free where the state ends and free market begins. Let me let me phrase it that way. Yeah. Well, part of part of uh, my function here, you know, we we know we're not going to get uh, forming the government. But what we have to do is we have to change the mindset of Canadians as to exactly what is the function of government. And uh, and I don't think the government it purposely goes around and takes away. Our freedoms. I don't think that's the way things work. I don't think uh, Premier McGuinty or Stephen Harper are uh, uh, going to say, "Oh yes, so what freedom should we pull away from Canadians today?" I think what governments have done and the way they've grown over these last fifty, sixty years, because they—that's really when the big, huge, uh, well, when governments became swollen, so to speak. What they've done is they've taken responsibilities away from Canadians. And, and by taking on these responsibilities, things that we should be doing for ourselves, the governments grow. And, of course, they require tax revenue, and that means they, uh, you're, you're left with less and less discretionary income. Back, back when my dad was working and uh, was able to take care of uh, our whole family, uh, he was, uh, I think the tax rate in Canada was something in the neighborhood of 28%. That was the total tax Canadian, federal, provincial, um, uh, the whole, all of the taxes right. to get together. Today it approaches 50%. Right. You know, we're in the 40, 50% range. Now, I wish I had time to develop that argument because taxes is a real pet peeve of mine. Well, it, well the, only way, the only way to get rid of taxes is to give back those responsibilities to, to Canadians that they should be doing themselves. Hmm. You know, our most important freedom, aside from our life, 
is our economic freedom. Because if you don't have economic freedom, you can't do the things that you want to do. If you spend half of your life working for the government, which is exactly what we do. I mean, the U.S., the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, and they will tell you, well, uh, sometime in June was the uh, date that we stopped working for the government. Half a year you spend you spend in paying your taxes, and the other half a year you uh, actually work for yourself. Yeah, well, that's, that's key talking about tax freedom because they've taken away those responsibilities. All right, let me move to the last topic uh, because I, I want to. This is more of a strategic, or uh, when you're when you're running your party and it's coming up time to an election, uh, because many of the people that you are trying to attract, uh, especially in the next election, I think this is going to play a very important role. And it's almost an unfair question, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, do you keep in mind the idea, uh, and how does that shape your policy and your election run in different areas, based on the fact that you will be drawing away votes from conservative candidates who are trying to defeat Dalton McGuinty? And no disrespect, I think you just admitted it, that the Ontario Libertari- Libertarian Party won't be forming the next government. It right. will likely be, the alternative would be, either the NDP or the Tories. So how does that figure into your strategy when it comes to running and trying to be successful as a party? Well, our strategy primarily is to find people who already agree with us. Uh, they're out there. You know, I, I think that probably between 5 and 10% of the people of uh, Ontario are, are already thinking like a libertarian, and, and those are the ones that need to come out and vote. I mean, you just, just go back to the last election, Nick, and think about how many people actually voted. 49.2% of the people actually who were eligible to vote actually voted. 49.2%. Yeah. It's one of the lowest in history. One of the lowest in history. Now, why was that? Well, the reason was that uh, that Tim Hudak and Dalton McGinty uh, were so close together that you needed a razor blade to 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 find out where they differed. They didn't differ at all. Okay. That was one of Mr. Hudak's problems, and okay. I hope they change their mind. And that's why we're there. Right. We're to we're we're there to say, okay, here are some other options for for Ontario. So you're why the conservative you NDP. You're you're to the uh, conservatives what the NDP were to the Liberals. Exactly. The, right. You know, the, the over the last fifty, sixty years, the NDP has uh, never formed a government in Canada. But every single one of their ideas is now part of law here in Canada. How did that happen? Alan, I wish we had time to discuss that more. That's been an hour. I appreciate your time this morning. I certainly hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank Absolutely. you for joining me. Thank uh, you very much. Have Thanks. a good day. All right, folks, that wraps it up for me today. Ubi Kata said more. Day of CBS. Good morning. God bless. Don't let anything disturb your peace. And may you have a fair wind and a following sea.